thank you for downloading our podcast. Daniel is a book that is given to us in a time when Judah's history is less than stellar. They are carried off into a foreign land. They have turned from our God. And now the Lord hands them over to the nation of Babylon. Is the Lord sovereign enough and strong enough to preserve his people? Is the Lord able to overpower this mighty world ruler, Nebuchadnezzar? Is Nebuchadnezzar the king who is able to do what his predecessors could not, build a prestigious tower so great and so strong that he could penetrate the very fortress of heaven? If you're curious about these questions, please stay tuned as we work through the book of Daniel. One of the biggest problems that fallen man can face in life is when man thinks he's on top of the world only to realize the ultimate reality that they're not above heaven. Which means that one can seem to possess everything and nothing at the same time. It's the very thing that Satan held out for Adam in the Garden of Eden. The false promise that if Adam determines what's right and wrong, Adam can determine what's right for Adam. He can bring God down, he can put God in his place, and Adam will be able to be the God of gods and the Lord of lords. See, Nebuchadnezzar understands the reality that while he may believe he's on the top of the world or he's the king of all things and he's an ultimate ruler, there's something that's plaguing his very heart and keeping him up at night. It's a realization that this may not be true. And as Christians, hopefully we realize this is not true. But in Nebuchadnezzar's mindset, he's coming to grips with the reality that there is something out there bigger than even the king himself. And he wants to know what this something is. Is it knowable? His wise men said, gods do not dwell amongst the people. Man cannot know gods. Well, we're going to find that that's not true at all. And so when we consider Nebuchadnezzar having this dream, what does this dream ultimately tell us about Nebuchadnezzar's fate and our fate? as we consider our lives in the kingdom of God that is realized today. And so as we consider this, we'll see first a granted audience, uh, how Daniel desires to meet with the king, how we find God's audience, God's answer, and God's ultimate, or granting ultimate accession. And so going on then with the granting of the audience, the, the thing to Remember, in all of this is a key verse in 2 verse 11. Call the attention to it in the introduction, but it's important to look at this verse. Remember what the wise men said. They said that there is no one who can show the king this dream except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. In other words, there are, are gods and there's man. Man has to trick gods. Man has to deceive gods. Man has to do something to divine what the gods want. God doesn't reveal anything to us. God can't tell us the future. God doesn't tell us what's going to happen. That's their mindset. Again, I'm not saying this is proper theology. I'm saying this is what the wise men of Babylon believe. That somehow you can trick gods and they can reveal some secret mystery to you Uh, god is impersonal is what they are saying he's not someone who dwells with the flesh it's very bad theology it's not true theology that they're laying out and so it shows we all have a theology we all have a, a doctrine of god it's an issue of which is the right doctrine and the lord's going to show why this is false doctrine because Daniel approaches Arioch. Now remember what, what Arioch is doing here. He's been commissioned by the king, not only to destroy the wise men, but to tear them limb from limb. Now knowing Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this is not something that's just exaggerated. It's not hyperbole. This is probably what the king literally commanded. Uh, this is not a very nice king, not a very nice man. And the reality of this is that Daniel understands his fate. Even though he hasn't finished his training, it doesn't matter. His fate is to be torn limb from limbs. Remember after praying to God, approaching Arioch with tact, 
Uh, Daniel asks his friends to also pray to God and ask God for his mercy, not based on their holiness, not based on their faithfulness, but based upon the Lord's mercy. They approach the Lord. And as they come before the Lord in mercy, they ask God to reveal and show them the dream. So now here's this moment where Daniel approaches Arioch and he says, I have the dream. I, I know what it is. It's the direct contradiction to 2 verse 11. The gods can't do this. The gods don't reveal this. Daniel's saying, actually, that's false. There is a true God who does reveal his intention for man, does reveal who he is. And I'm going to tell you what he has in store for the king. So as Daniel says this, and he approaches Arioch, we do wonder what he is going to do. Because we find in, in verse 24 what Daniel says. And it's something that could concern us initially. We, we don't know what, what's going on here, if it's a rush, if it's an attack. It's important to understand the contrast of what goes on here when Daniel stands before the king versus Arioch. He approaches Arioch and he says, I will show the king the interpretation. It's just a statement of fact. Now, is Daniel claiming credit for himself? Is he claiming that he's the one who's a great diviner? Is that what he's going to do with this? But whatever the case, it's important to know it is Daniel who approaches Arioch. Arioch's not going around with the wise men saying, do you have the king's interpretation? Did you receive a vision? Do you know what's going to happen to the king? No, he's carrying out his orders. So he's not doing any investigation, not any inquiry. And so we find that, that this becomes rather important because when Arioch meets with the king, uh, asking for him to grant, uh, basically, Daniel to meet with the king, notice what Arioch says. He doesn't say, hey, one of the exiles took me aside and he wants to meet with you because he claims that he's got an interpretation to this dream. That would be a true statement. That would be a recounting of what we find in verse 24. But we are in yeah, verse 24. But we find that when Arioch approaches the king, what does he say? I have found. In other words, he's saying, look at me. I'm a guy of value. I don't just go around and, and haphazardly destroy people like you said. Before I destroyed him, I wanted to, to find the guy that had the right interpretation. And so it's not Daniel took me aside. It's not there's a, a God out there that contradicts our God, and, and you really should take this seriously and listen to this. It's no, I have found the guy. I'm going to save the kingdom. I'm the savior. I'm important. And so you see how Arioch is using Daniel to prop himself up. And so now we wonder, well, Daniel's the one who took Arioch aside and said, I have the interpretation. So when Daniel is granted this opportunity to come before the king, before Nebuchadnezzar, what's Daniel going to do? Uh, is Daniel going to be the one who props himself up? And is he the one who's going to say that he's great? And so we have this important contrast. We have this tension already here in the story. Daniel's gone to his um, companions, as the text tells us, praise on behalf of God's mercy, not upon his faithfulness, not upon his worthiness. Please on God's mercy that the Lord would save them and the wise men and spare their lives. And the Lord has given him a vision. Is Daniel going to stand in the king's presence like Arioch and say, I have the dream, I have the interpretation, I'm significant. When we find that there's the ultimate audience that God calls to our attention. That while Arioch promotes himself, we find in verses 26 through 35, Daniel now entering the scene. Arioch's promoted himself. He goes away, may still be in the room. We have no idea. But it's most likely Daniel and the king. And as Daniel is there, notice that the text tells us it's Daniel. God is my judge. That his name is Belteshazzar, which basically means a bell will preserve or, or bell will protect. So again, remember, it's that transferring of identity that Daniel, now Belteshazzar, is going to be protected by the foreign Babylonian god, which is rather funny because the Chaldeans, the best of the best, couldn't tap into the Babylonian gods and get an interpretation. But yet Daniel, God is my judge, stands before the king. And when Daniel stands before the king, 
we have the king asking him, are you the one who has my dream and its interpretation? So remember that test. I'm not going to tell you my dream. You have to find my dream because then I know that whoever gave me that dream or torments me through that dream is going to give you the proper interpretation. So again, it's important. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar did not forget the dream. He knows the dream, but he wants to know that whoever brings him the interpretation can also bring him the dream. So Daniel then presents to the king the reality of this dream. That it's not that he's one who's manipulated God. He's not one who's shown the proper way to trick God, but he answers him. And he says, first of all, the contrast of who he is to the other men. So he says the diviners, the enchanters, the magicians. So he's calling attention to that reality. They're not the ones who can bring uh, the interpretation because they're not those who are really tapped into the true God of heaven. And this is where we find the significant contrast in verse 28. Ariok, I found the man. Daniel, I have the interpretation. Let me meet with the king. We don't know where he's going to go with it. But verse 28, we find exactly where Daniel goes with this. He says, listen, they, they can't divine from the God of heaven because they don't know the God of heaven. The God of heaven is not their God. But there is a God who actually reveals things. There is a God who reveals mysteries. There is a God who orders history. There is a God who raises up kings and brings kings down. And Daniel's saying, I'm going to tell you about this God. In other words, it's not Daniel saying, I am wise. I did this. I'm faithful enough. I found the way to penetrate into heaven, unlike the Tower of Babel or these other guys. But he's saying, God has been pleased to reveal to me the mysteries of his intention. And so as he reveals this to the king, he wants the king to understand it's not because of his wisdom. It's not because of who he is. It's because God has been merciful to Daniel and even merciful to this king. So Daniel then lays out what he sees, and we find why the king would, would be upset. So we have this overwhelming statue, and, and the picture here that Daniel's laying out is Nebuchadnezzar is basically standing in front of the statue because he says the statue you saw. So the implication is that somehow Nebuchadnezzar is conscious that he is in the area wherever this statue is, whether it's outside, whether it's set up in, in Babylon, or whether it's just in some land. We, we don't know the exact scene or setting, but it's irrelevant. Nebuchadnezzar is standing before the statue. That's the point. So as he stands before the statue, he sees that the head is made of gold. Then we find that the arms are silver, the torso and the thighs are bronze, and then we have the, the legs being iron, and then we have the feet being iron and clay. Now, the thing that becomes so disturbing about the statue that the implications, it's rather overwhelming in its presence. It's large, it's big, and, and these are, are strong metals. You, you would think that these metals are indestructible. But then there's this imagery of this little rock being cut out, and as this rock comes, it it's basically tramples on, on the foot. And as it stomps on the foot, this statue just basically blows apart. Uh, it, it shatters. It becomes like, like chaff on, on, on the threshing floor. That is, this thing that should be strong and mighty is, is shattered and is no more and just blows away. And so you can understand why, why that's a little troubling. You would expect it to topple. You would expect maybe something else to happen. But instead, you see that it becomes basically like, like the part of the, the harvest that's thrown away, that you have no value for it. It's just, it gets taken by the wind, and it's a nothingness. And so that's the dream. That's Daniel meeting with the king. So Daniel goes on in verse 36, that he wants the king to understand the interpretation. Now, keep in mind, when Daniel's given the interpretation, he's already told uh, the king and, and labored the point in verse 30, this isn't me. I'm not the wise man. I, I don't have some special gift. I, I'm not specially faithful. I'm just, I'm just a guy that the Lord has placed in this particular circumstance. That's the focus. That's the orientation. Quite contrary to Arioch or Nebuchadnezzar. But when he goes on and gives this interpretation in verse 36, 
He wants the king to understand something. But before we go on, notice how he identifies the king. It's hard to miss the reality of this Adamic-type language of where you have this situation where Nebuchadnezzar is set up like the Lord, or set up like Adam in the Garden of Eden, rules over this creation, has dominion over this creation, is the one who is basically the, the king over the world, the thing Daniel wants him to understand. This isn't accidental. This is by the Lord's providence. The Lord has set him here. And so this isn't that Babylon is a new Eden, it isn't that Babylon is, is something that we look to and say, oh, there we find the Lord accomplishing his ultimate purpose. No, we see it as a satanic Eden. It's basically Babylon has accomplished its goal. That here you have one who divines from the true God of heaven who's come down with the Tower of Babel desired to do. That it could harness the words from the gods and it could manipulate the God. And here even Daniel's conceding by God's uh, providence and by the Lord's working that the Lord has raised up Nebuchadnezzar and placed him in and allowed him to be in sort of this Edenic type situation but it's not the full glory of heaven it's quite contrary once again the men of Abel get what they desired in the plains of Shinar they wanted God to come down so God comes down and God reveals to him listen yeah you can say that you're in this Edenic type garden but it's not a garden that I've built it's not a garden that honors me. It's not a garden where I have fellowship and, and where my glory is displayed. And so he's saying this is what's going to happen. So these statues then, as Daniel lays it out, that this, these different uh, sections of the statues represent four different kingdoms. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself being placed by the Lord's uh, providence and in the Lord's care, as even Jeremiah grants, he's a Lord's servant. He'll have his time. The Lord raises him up. The Lord allows him to be. So that's Babylon, the first empire, as he's the head of gold, you know, beauty, he's the top of it all. But then you have these kingdoms that grow in inferiority. You have Persia that's going to take away Babylon. You have then Greece that overpowers Persia. You have then Rome that sort of takes Persian culture and sort of blends it together. And so you have these four kingdoms and, and these four empires that seem great that the Lord is going to raise up. So it's important to understand. These are not these kingdoms that stand. These are not these kingdoms that endure. And they are not accidental. Now in terms of what the Lord is doing with this, we have then that picture of this rock that's cut out of stone by a hand. The hand comes, takes a rock, and it smashes the feet of the statue, making it basically go away. But the declaration is there's this fourth kingdom that basically where this rock is going to come and is going to arrive in history. Now when we think about that, we think of predictions like Psalm 118. Uh, we think of how Christ takes Psalm 118 of the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, that you have this stone that is discarded, where you have what does the Roman Empire do? Well, it's not Rome that necessarily sends Christ to the cross. You have a riot. You have Pilate basically miscarrying justice, saying, I pronounce him innocent, but I'm too much of a coward to do what's right. So you guys take him, you execute him, and I want no part of it. But nevertheless, uh, he is one who knows that Christ is innocent and should have done something. So you find how there's that miscarriage of justice in a Roman Empire, sending Christ to the cross. Now, as a result of that, that event is what ultimately undoes what these kingdoms stand for. So while these kingdoms arrive in history, what do they stand for? Well, what did we say about Babylon? Babylon has accomplished the ideal. It has set up the Eden of this world, but it's a satanic Eden. It's not an Eden where God dwells and roams and communes with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. No, he's taken dominion of the world, but it has not been a dominion that is honorable at all. And so the Lord is taking out these kingdoms. The Lord is showing that the kingdom he promised at the exit of Eden in Genesis 3.15 is coming about through an unlikely event, a little stone, Mighty kingdoms, mighty empires. But this little event that seems insignificant defangs and takes out these very empires. 
crushes the feet, crushes the city of man, and shows the ultimate establishment and building up of the heavenly kingdom. Now, in terms of how this happens then with Christ uh, accomplishing uh, this event, we find that this mountain then, or this little rock grows into a big mountain. What do we think about in terms of a mountain theology in scripture? Well, we have the battle of Armageddon, the mountain battle, the mountain of judgment, where we have the assembling of the nations before this mountain, where Gog and Magog carry out the ultimate ideal, a movement to the ultimate Mount Zion. So it's telling us that this kingdom will be realized with this one who comes, enters history, uh, who dies, who accomplishes uh, what God has set out for him to do as a faithful priest, uh, offers himself as a faithful priest, emerges as a triumphant priest, confirming the prophetic words of scripture as the action of God, establishes his kingdom that's international, and as a kingdom comes with him, we have then the ultimate uh, building of that mountain that endures forever, the true Mount Zion, that the Lord has not forsaken his promise. This is very profound. As Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's on top of the world and he has established his own Eden, his own power, his own majesty, he cannot overpower the true God of heaven. And so Nebuchadnezzar then, we find that he responds to this and he grants the secession. He, he grants what uh, Daniel has said. And we find that, that this reaction ultimately seems positive. He praises Daniel. He's thankful for what Daniel has done. He pays homage to Daniel. But you see, this is problematic because Daniel has labored the point I'm not special. I didn't do anything to deserve this. God, by his mercy, has desired to use me in this particular time. And so instead of turning to Daniel's God and worshiping the true God, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, Nebuchadnezzar worships Daniel. He worships the means. He doesn't worship the substance. He looks to, to Daniel as this new God and this object of his worship, or at least one of the many gods. He grants that it's Daniel's God who's significant. In other words, there's not one true God, that Daniel's God is just one God amongst many gods, and maybe he's higher than the other ones. But the reality is Nebuchadnezzar truly does not grasp the fullness of what's being revealed here. We find that Daniel's life is spared. We find that Daniel is one who, like what we had, we mentioned with Joseph, as the one who is somewhat stained but yet faithful to the Lord, we have now the other one who's unstained and again is promoted to a high place. We have this typology reminding us of the ultimate outcome of Christ. And so then in, in terms of this, as Daniel is placed in this position, he is head of all the wise men. As he's head of all the wise men, we find uh, that his companions are also those who are then placed in charge of the affairs of the province of, of Babylon. And so we find that these men are ultimately exalted, and it seems that their life is spared, and that Nebuchadnezzar may in fact be understanding and conceding the will of the Lord. Only to find that when we turn to chapter 3, that Nebuchadnezzar radically misunderstands the intention of uh, this prophecy. But nevertheless, when we move on and we ask that question of what does this dream of Nebuchadnezzar ultimately tell us about his fate and our fate? It's a reminder that this dream makes clear that whatever Nebuchadnezzar has established, however majestic he may think he is, he's only established it because the Lord and his providence allowed him to establish it. It's not because Nebuchadnezzar is majestic in and of himself, he is not a god in and of himself, even as we find in chapter 3, he at least sees himself as sort of in the status of a demigod to a god himself. But we find that the Daniel's made clear, the Lord's made clear through Daniel. This is not the case. We also find that the Lord is the one who has shattered the powers of this age. That the very absurd thing of Christ going to the cross and moving from death to life secures our identity in peace. That as he has been raised from the dead, it secures the ultimate victory and the outcome of the battle of Armageddon. The Lord is the one who brings that final and definitive judgment, bringing his people to the true Mount Zion by his grace and his mercy. 
It is the assurance that the Lord sustains his people. The encouragement for us is that as we read the news, and we can find history obviously ebbs and flows, and there's times when it seems the world isn't going so well and isn't being so receptive or embracing of Christianity, and other times it seems certainly more embracing and accepting of Christianity. We have to understand history ebbs and flows. It doesn't mean that God has forsaken his program. It doesn't mean the kingdom of heaven is not here and not realized. It's understanding that we keep our eyes focused above the firmament. That we are a people who, as we follow Daniel's example, what does he do? It's not me, it's the Lord. It's not my glory, it's his glory. And it's understanding the very prayer of what John the Baptist prays when Christ walks this earth. He's the one that says, I must decrease, he must increase. It's a call then for us to desire to live out that heavenly calling of servitude to our Lord and our King, who has called us as his redeemed people, who has laid down his life, emptied himself of his significance so we can have life in him, forgiveness of sins in him, and we can be empowered to live for him. So let us then continually die to self, live unto our Lord as he is our victor and our King and our Redeemer, who has conferred upon us everlasting life. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archived sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.